Welcome to Gen Z Hoops. The Gen Z Basketball Coaching and Sports Business Show. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Gen Z Hoops Podcast. I'm joined by a special guest today, current recruiter and NBA draft trend analyst, Christian Kavasovic. Christian, how are you doing today, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Ashton. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Um, I'd like to kick off our little discussion here. Um, can you please tell us about your connection to basketball and growing up at a young age? Yeah, so obviously I love, loved playing basketball growing up, you know, in the backyard, at school, stuff like that. Uh, but I grew up in Cleveland, so obviously I had LeBron growing up. Oh, yeah. uh, some exciting years there watching those Cavs teams. It was a little heartbreaking when he went to Miami, but thankfully he came back, won us a championship. So uh, it's hard not to be a basketball fan growing up in Cleveland <laughs> during that time. Oh, man, I'm so sorry we had to steal him from you like that. Like, I'm a huge Miami Heat fan, actually. He is my favorite player, though. It was kind of heartbreaking. You guys stole him back from us in 2014 right there and then sent yeah, us into a mini rebuild. Yeah, we got some more good years out of him. But yeah, everybody was happy. It was like I said, it was heartbreaking when he left, but then he won a championship for Cleveland. And I actually came back home for that parade. And, and that was just an amazing experience to come back for that. I remember watching that parade on TV. Actually, I saw people like standing in buildings, like hanging off, like not in a dangerous way, like kind of hanging off the side of them in a little in, in some sort of just to get a glimpse of LeBron, Kyrie and all Kevin Love with the belt holding it up. Like, yeah, the WWE yeah. One of the wildest things. So we took we took the city bus because that was the easiest way to get to the parade that day. And it was the craziest thing. All the streets were just there was nobody driving on the streets. It was just all the city buses going one direction towards downtown. It was the wildest thing I ever saw. Wow, that's insane. Uh, did you ever go to any of those championship games of, from the Warrior Series? I went, I don't think I went in 20, uh, 2016 when we won, but I went to a couple final. I went to a finals game in 2015, and I went to a couple more playoff games here and there. But uh, yeah, I was already in school at that time. I was in Oregon at that time already, so I couldn't get to a bunch, but I did I did hit a few games during those years. Okay, that's nice, man. Um, so when did you know that you wanted to work in sports? Yeah, so I think it ties back to those those like LeBron years. I, I loved basketball and I always loved business as well. And I wanted to find a career that could that could bring those two things together. So I mean, everybody always thinks like the sports agent route. So that was one thing that was always in the back of my head. But I also wanted to learn about like basketball ops and even the business ops side of things. So I was open to all of those. And I was just looking for a school really that could teach me all of those basics. So uh, I remember I remember it clearly. It was my sophomore year of high school. My mom brought this big book. It was like a fat book, like thousands of pages. She just plopped it down on the table and she's like, OK, go go pick your college, like figure out it was a guide. So it had all of the information about all these schools. And I was just so focused on like sports business, sports management. And I had narrowed it down to a few schools. So it was like Oregon, Oklahoma, South Carolina. And I went on a visit at Oregon and I did early decision there and I got in and the rest is history, you know? So right. Oregon has Nike up there. They have Portland Trailblazers, Portland Timbers. Um, obviously huge athletic department there with a lot of opportunities so after I went on my visit there it was everything that I that I thought it was going to be and and that's just where I ended up picking yeah um I mean I saw on your LinkedIn that you were part of clubs such as the Warsaw Sports Business Club Warsaw Sports Analytics Club and the Warsaw Sports Marketing Podcast um can you give us a little insight about your roles in these clubs and like what experiences you faced yeah, so uh, one of those reasons why I did pick Oregon was was the Warsaw Club, and they have speakers like you wouldn't believe some of the speakers that we had. We had uh, Ashton Eaton and his wife Brienne Eaton, so they're both Olympic medalists. They went to Oregon, and they were just in in our club meeting, just like we're talking right now. Like you could ask them any question and ask them about insane. their experiences. It was yeah, it was insane. Uh, we had Tinker Hatfield, who's designed like multiple pairs of Jordans and Air Maxes, like just come into our club meetings. So that was one of those reasons, just because the types of speakers that we could have. Um, also through that club, we went on a lot of site visits. So like I mentioned, like Nike HQ, uh, Portland, Portland Trailblazers, Portland Timbers. Uh, we went in and got like behind the scenes looks to all of, all of their operations, how they do their day-to-day -day stuff. Walking around the Nike campus was super cool. Um, so yeah, I've done multiple trips there. They had 
uh, sports marketing agencies too. Portland is known for sports marketing agencies. So that club just gave their students so much, um, so many opportunities to really have that behind the scenes look. And I felt like Oregon was one of the only places that if I picked for college that that could give me something like that. Um, so yeah, that was, that was Warsaw club. And then the podcast, uh, very similar, very similar again to, to this type of situation, reaching out to people mm -hmm. who are working in sports business. I was, I was like 19, 19, 20 years old, reaching out to people who I thought I could learn some things from. Um, so yeah, just, yeah. Reaching out <laughs> on LinkedIn, like, Hey, I thought your experience is cool. Do, are you interested in, in joining our podcast? So just a lot of those little things, uh, again, resume builders, you always have to be, when you're a student, you have to be thinking about all those little resume builders that can help you down the line, especially if you want to work in sports for a long time. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, on my experience, like running this podcast, actually, it's like kind of really opened my eyes to like so many different jobs that are in like in sports. Like I like as a kid, like you mainly think like, oh, you have to be a coach, you have to be a GM or something. But like there's so many different roles that are in each organization that like contribute to winning. Like from your experience, was was there ever like an, that sort of eye opening like moment for you? Yeah, I mean, just yeah, the sheer number of roles you think you think yeah, you have your coaches, you have your uh, ticket sales people, yeah. or whatever it may be. But I mean, there's like a dedicated lawyer that each team has. There's right. sports nutritionists. There's sports psychologists. There's uh, business analytics people. Whole so media like team. all of yeah, all of those yeah. yeah, social media that that really was getting huge. Um, during that time that I was reaching out to people too, is like that push for having a huge social media presence. So yeah, I think it's just going to keep growing. There's, I mean, now you have sports betting, so there might be like certain oh, yeah. people uh, working primarily just sports betting type roles. So I think it's just going to grow and grow. Sports are obviously just getting bigger and bigger each year. Yeah, I totally agree. So um, in 2020, you worked as a post-grad recruiting and operations coordinator for DME Academy. How are you able to get this position and what were the biggest challenges with this role? Yeah, so that DME role, that was after I had graduated already, um, but I had been there in, in the past as an intern. So 2017 summer, uh, I was I was at DME initially uh, doing something very similar. So over the summer, we were recruiting kids to come to uh, to come to the academy for the following year. So scheduling scheduling visits with families uh, and then guiding tours. So when those families come in, you're answering all of their questions that they have, like, is my kid going to be in good hands? Yep. What's their exposure going to be like? What's your playing schedule like? So at, answering all of those questions to not only put their mind at ease that their kid is going to uh, an academy where they're going to have a good academic experience, athletic experience, but how are you setting them up for that next right. step? Um, so again, long story short, I, yeah. I was there summer of 2017 and then came back for a full year after, after I had graduated. Um, and the main thing, the main reason why I came back was just keeping in touch with everybody who I had worked with. Relationships are obviously huge in sports. So just making sure that even if it's three years later, you're you're keeping all of those relationships uh, going, checking in with people. Uh, and yeah, and then you you get to have a job lined up for you when you're when you're done with school. Um, yeah, most most definitely. Yeah. Um, I actually went to a boarding school up in Connecticut. It's called um Salisbury okay. School. Um, I would always, my coach would always like, tell me to talk on the phone with some of the new recruits coming in for our basketball team. And then I would always see him like showing new guys around and stuff like that. Um, what a, a story that like really like helped me um, resonate with what you just um, told me um, the former basketball coach at our school, um, Jeff Ruskin, he would always um, have huge AU teams, like full AU teams come down to like the school on, on like our Sunday, which is our day off at school over there mm -hmm. um, when he was the head coach. And um the parents would always ask them those tough questions. Like you said, um, like what's the academic schedule looking like? Um, where do you see my son fitting into this program? He would mm -hmm. simply tell them, um, like playing time isn't guaranteed. Everything is earned here. Everyone has to work their way up. Um, in your experience, uh, um, over at DME Academy, was there ever like a moment where you had to answer those tough questions to those families and players? Yeah. And I mean, it, you always try to be fair. Luckily, that wasn't my decision for, for the playing time. I left that up to the head coach. Oh, yeah. Not that that was my decision, but it was the head coach's decision. But I think just having that honesty and, and open lines of communication, always always telling kids that if they put in the work, they're going to get their chance. And, and I truly right. do feel like our head coach, he did give everybody a fair chance. Um, 
to give everybody a fair chance. If you're if you're putting in the work, you're going to get your chance to shine. It might not be every game, but when you get called on, like you'll you'll be ready to go, you know, and we trust that you'll be ready to go. So uh, another thing that you said, too, was just the challenges that I faced in that role. Uh, so I, I want to make sure that I hit on that because yeah. this, this goes for any role in sports, I would say. So you have your job description that you sign up for all the fun stuff, the recruiting right. or, or coaching, whatever that may be. Uh, but there's whenever you work in sports, there's going to be so much more that's not in that job description that you're still going to be responsible for. And you just have to you have to be so willing to do that. It's going to be long hours. Um you're going to just have to, things have to get done and somebody has to do it. And when you're the new guy coming in, that has to be your responsibility. Yeah. And if you, if you want to grow, if truly grow it in, in sports, you're going to have to put in your time. So um, that was, I would say one of the main challenges, but I think everybody goes through it, especially everybody. If you're a GM for a sports team or your head coach for a sports team, you put in your, your work and you've made your way up to that. So it's just like a rite of passage. When you're the new guy, you have to you have to do the jobs that not everybody wants to do always. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, actually, when I played over in Greece, um, one of my coaches, um, um, Coach Nick Nick Lagios, he's the um GM of the uh, Mexico City Capitanes now. Before, when he started, when he first started off working in the NBA, he um worked for the Lakers. Um, at that time, he I remember him telling me on the bus before one of our games, he was like, "Yeah, Ash, like." I only had like one shirt they that they gave me. I had to like do all the all the work before I even stepped on the court. I had to be pumping up basketballs in the closet, making sure everything was ready to go for all the players. So he so he like had to go through that as well. Like doing all like the the small little things and then he got as he kept working his way up, he got rewarded with doing more on the court stuff with all the players. I remember he was telling me he was working out with like Alex Caruso, Speed Makai Luke at one point. Hmm. And now looking at him, he's the GM of the Mexico City Capitanes now. So That's everybody's insane. done it. I mean, washing jerseys after practice, making sure everything's yeah. ready for practice the next day. Everybody, I'm sure everybody's done it who's gotten to those to those positions. But obviously he shows that 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 hard work pays off in the end. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so when you were recruiting, what made you um I always ask like whoever I have come in contact with who is like who had dealt with recruiting, um what made you go after a player? Like what made a player stand out to you? I mean, a lot of it is relationships. So we had, we had our own coaching staff um, and, and like the CEO, the managers of, of DME, they all have recruiting networks. So uh, we didn't just focus on the United States. The cool thing about oh. that was that we had, it was so multicultural. So we had players from like France, Spain, Finland, Latvia, Estonia, Serbia, Russia, um, Tunisia, Egypt. Wow. I mean, I could keep going on and on. Jordan, Mexico, Central and South America. Like it was so cool. That was probably my favorite part of of working there was just all the different cultures and hearing all the different uh, languages. You walk into the dorm room for lunch or whatever, and you just hear all the languages from across the whole world. That was just such a such a cool experience. You had your own uh, melting pot, as they would say over there, right? Definitely. Definitely, yeah. Oh wow, that's amazing. Um, so in um so in 2021, you created your own website, uh, Draft Trends. What was your thought process that made you create this website? Yeah, so so Draft Trends, the website started in 2021, but I've been doing draft like NBA draft analysis since high school. I was I'm probably going on like 10, 11 years of of doing it. So it was just a spreadsheet for the longest time. It was a huge, huge spreadsheet. Um, and I would just go in, I would look at all the mock drafts online uh, and then create my own rankings based on what I would compare mock drafts that I see online based on watching my own players and watching my own college games and, or uh, yeah, college and high school and overseas games and then creating my own rankings. So that started like 10 years ago. And then I finally had the means to start Draft Trends, the website, and that launched in 2021. So um, just just the ability to make it bigger and I still want to continue growing it. So that's, that's why it launched in 2021, but it's been, been around for a long time uh, on, on my Excel sheets. <laughs> that's, that's amazing, man. Um, so when making these projections for like each player, do you mainly use statistics to make these, um, to make these projections? I would say it's a combination. It's not just statistics because stats don't always convert directly so I think there's a combination of of watching the games in person, seeing there's so much more to a projection than just can can a player hit 
36 percent on three pointers right. or more you know what i mean so you have to watch what they're doing off the ball how do they move you know what i mean what, how are they on defense are they getting back you know mm -hmm. um so it's a combination i would say of statistics uh statistics and just watching the games uh yourself because you can't you can't just scout a player based on on statistics alone yeah i totally agree just out of curiosity you know as i said before i'm a huge miami heat fan <laughs> In last year's draft, where did you have Jaime Jaquez ranked on on your website? I think I think he's killing it. I just want to preface all of this with saying like I think he's killing it this year. But I wasn't I wasn't super high on him. I mean, I watched being an Oregon fan. Though, I, I saw the games UCLA versus Oregon, so I I saw that he was a good player. But I didn't, to be honest, I didn't think he was going to be as good in the NBA as he is showing right now. So I think I had him somewhere in the second. Um, oh, probably wow. mid to late second. Yeah, I didn't have him as high as a lot of people did, but obviously he's he's proven me wrong right now. Also, I know in twenty in twenty back. Let's take it back to like twenty seventeen, right? With that Lonzo yeah. Ball, Jason Tatum draft. You know how everyone that year. I remember everyone. I recall hearing everyone saying that Kyle Kuzma was like such like a steal of that draft. Was he act? Was he in your first round? Do you remember at all? I I honestly don't think I had him in my first round, but. Uh, 2017 out of all my years doing doing the uh mock drafts and, and projections and stuff like that i would say 2017 was probably my my most successful um because because i had out of those first six picks that was i had it completely like nailed for those those first six picks i think it was right was it Foltz, lonzo, lonzo tatum josh jackson yep uh, De'Aaron Fox and then uh, Jonathan Isaac and right. I had all those six like dead on going That's to all amazing. of those teams yeah and then and then what happened oh it was Minnesota traded their pick to Chicago and yep. then they picked Larry Markinen and then that just threw off the whole rest of my oh, sheet because it's hard to it's hard to predict trades but I remember specifically that 2017 draft that was like going so well and then that trade just threw everything <laughs> I still can't believe the Celtics had the number one pick of that draft and then they traded down to the third pick and still got the player they wanted. Yeah, I think I think they just knew they knew he was gonna be available because they knew how high the Sixers were on on Fultz. And then Lonzo to the Lakers. That was like the yeah. only team he worked out for that summer, I remember. Right, right. But yeah, that was I mean, Tatum was my favorite player in that draft. So when I do these projections, I do one sheet where I predict how the draft is actually going to go. And then I have my own big board where it's oh. like my actual favorite player. So even though Tatum was my favorite player, I didn't think the Sixers were going to draft him. So that's why I had him going third to right. uh, Celtics. But yeah, that's that's why I have two lists when, whenever I'm making the projections. Like if I was the GM or, or the person, the decision maker, where would I pick them? And then how I actually think the draft is going to go. Man, it's, it's great to like uh, actually finally like talk to someone who actually like, is like an analyst for these types of trends. Like, if anything, I I usually just like play the GM mode in 2K. Like since I was really little, and then see the whole mock draft, see where my team, my franchise falls in the lottery, and then let the game do it for me. But like to hear yeah. the different like motives behind this behind this whole process, it's really interesting. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier when you asked me how I got into basketball and how I wanted to start working in this, but I was definitely a a my gm nerd too so Let's i don't go. know how many hundreds of hours i logged into that i don't want to look at my like xbox uh hours <laughs> hours log of, of 2k over the years which 2k did you start at um like really playing a lot this was yeah. it wasn't the first time i ever played 2k but probably like 2k 10 i would say was the one that i played the but i probably logged edition, like 100 probably. hours at least into yeah i like as the like as i'm as I'm getting older now, it's like insane to see like how much like I look on my like PlayStation, how like little I play each file like on mm -hmm. on the games. Like now, I think yeah, two K twenty four. I like barely touch my PlayStation anymore. Yeah, see? I just don't have time anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it was like when I had when I had the time, I was I was logging those hours, but but yeah, it's when you grow up, you don't have as much time free time for two K anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember I remember like logging on. Um, like selecting the Knicks because like trading because I want like the New York to finally get a championship one day since I'm since I'm from New York. But um, mm -hmm. I remember logging on as the Knicks and then like trading everybody somehow again, like LeBron and like creating a whole super team on that. Yeah, uh, that was me with the I think it was two. It should have been probably 2K11, right? When when LeBron left and then you just start with the Cavs with like Luke Mo Harris Williams, and Demi Erden and Mo Williams and you just yeah. have to trade everybody for whatever. <laughs> 
vets you can get and then sign some free agents and hopefully rebuild after 10 years. Yeah, I know. Right. That it's insane. Um, so back to like your, um, your website of NBA draft trends, what do you think is your favorite part of like running this website and continuously doing all these uh, mock drafts year after year? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing for me right now is just, I see so much potential with it still, but going back to, I have, I have my own career now working in staffing and I just don't have enough time as much as I'd like to dedicate to it. So, I mean, I would be so open to if somebody's interested in helping me with this type of thing, if this is the path that somebody wants to go in their career, I, I encourage somebody to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And, and if, if you're big into Excel or uh, data analysis and have those types of tools, uh, like predictive modeling, anything like that, I, I highly recommend that any of your listeners reach out to me because I see so much potential for this. I brought this to a certain level, but I think the possibilities are endless with this. And this would be a great resume builder or or just something that somebody can put in their in their work experience when they do go look for that, that NBA job, something that's tangible that they can bring to that interview with an NBA team and show them like, look, this is what I've worked on the past few years. And I think it's really transferable to a job with your team, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I wish you luck in the future on that, on that project of yours. Um, so you're currently the senior recruiter for Robert Half. Um, can you explain a little bit about like what Robert Half is and what the position entails? Yeah. So after, after my time with DME, I had the opportunity to move to, recruiting, not not on the sports side of things, but recruiting on the staffing side of things. So what Robert Half is, is a staffing agency. Uh, my current role, I find people jobs who are app and web developers. Um, so people who design like Facebook or people who design for Google, like jobs like that. Um, and yeah, so when I was switching careers, there was actually a lot of transferable skills. So when I was working for DME, we were trying to find the right college fit for our players. So right. you determine uh, what academic level are your are your players? Are they 4.0 students or or not not 4.0 students? And then you match that with their are they a high? Uh, wait, I'll replay. <laughs> no, you then you it. you um, then you find what academic and athletic level they are. Right. So are they a 4.0 student or not quite a 4.0 student? athletically are they a high major are they a juco candidate are they a d3 uh, candidate and then you take all of that and then you match that to the schools that are that are good fits for them so the way that that's transferable into my current job is when i find a candidate i identify what those top skills there are for them i identify what those top skills are for them so uh what are they the best at how many years of experience do they have and then what are those industries that they're really interested in and then you find a client that matches that skill set with with what the client needs so very similar you have athletes and their desires and then you have a college coach and their needs and you match those and it's very similar to what i do today that's great man so um when you look into the future for your future goals and aspirations for your career what do you what do you envision yeah, so I always try to stay in the moment. Right now, I'm I'm happy. I I like helping people in in the role that I have. Um, finding people new jobs is is really cool for me. I still do. Obviously, I have draft trends here on the side. Right. Um, I have some other things that I'm working on. Like one of my friends, he's a sports agent in Europe, and he actually just bought a team in Europe. And yeah. I'm lucky enough to be part of. I'm a minority owner in that team, so we're gonna see how that that congratulations. Continues. Thank you. Like that, that's that been a dream of mine ever since I was in my GM mode as like a 10 year old, 11 year old. Uh, I didn't think I would have this opportunity until I was like 40, 50 years old. But he he messaged me a couple months ago and said, Christian, I, I just bought a team. Are you interested in in being a part of this? So so we'll see. Maybe Draft Trends can be a part of uh, how we how we help find players for that team. So I'm excited yeah, to see how definitely. that works. So where is the team located? Uh, they're actually a Greek team. There's some stuff that's still getting ironed out, so I can't share too much. Okay. Um, but it's it's a team in Greece, and uh, they've won the championship before. They won the Greek championship in the past, uh, so we're trying to bring them back up to those to those heights right now. Oh man, I I as I mentioned before, I actually went over to Greece when I was in high school with um this organization called um Super League Athletic Academy, mm -hmm. and that's where I met my mentor John Hardafilis, and like. Our, our our whole coaching staff was like NBA coaches and uh, a GM Nick Lagios. He was our one of our coaches as well. 
phenomenal basketball that's played over there. Don't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, don't don't understand the level of, of skill that there is overseas um, until they've actually either gone to a game in, in Europe or not just Europe. It can be anywhere overseas. But uh, once people actually see that atmosphere and how passionate the fans are over there um, or players, the, the players that might not have worked out in the NBA or G League and then they get the chance to play in Europe and they realize how competitive it is. I mean, uh, yeah, any of those European leagues, they're they're pretty strong still. Like Spain, um, Spain, you have the Euro League, Greece, all of those teams, they're still really good. So I think people just need to experience that firsthand for them to really respect it and see how how strong of basketball is being played over there. My first my first experience in one of those professional arenas over in Greece um was when I was in um my first time on that trip with Super League. I remember we mm -hmm. went to watch on um, Panathinaikos play and Thanasi Santadokounmpo was playing over there at the time. Mm -hmm. I remember like there were like fans that were like throwing smoke bombs in the arena, like cursing out the like the in the other the opposing team in Greek. They were like burning the other team's flag. I remember they're passionate. That's passion yeah, right there. That is passion. It was it was nothing I would have ever thought of, at, like prior to being like coming from the United States and then witnessing that insane. Like I remember we looked up like in the sky and we saw like a, a huge mushroom over like over the yeah. arena because their arenas are like opened up at the top. It's like our football stadiums are here, like a MetLife stadium or something like yeah, that. Man. And they're huge. Like I was like, man, you would never see anything like this at Madison Square Garden or anything like that. Right. Yeah. I think, I think they need to, for safety purposes, they need to be opened up just because of, like you said, the, the flares that are going off or smoke, smoke bombs that they have. Yeah. Um, it's just wild. But yeah, I'm, I'm actually planning on going to Europe in April, hopefully around playoff time and then getting, getting to watch the team in the playoffs. So I'm excited about that trip coming up. Well, I I wish you safe travels and um Christian, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um I wish you luck with the rest of with owning the team and um continuing your work on your website NBA Draft Trends. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Ashton. Thanks for listening to Gen Z Hoops. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all major social media platforms at Gen Z Hoops. You can tune in and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and every other podcast platform on the planet. Get ready for the next episode.